Okay. I'm going to get through this fast because I've got somebody else coming in here after, but please uh, don't hesitate to interrupt me with questions if you have. Okay, the next thing you need to do is profile your best customers. Everybody has good customers and bad customers. So what you have to do is look at who are your best customers and figure out where they came from, how did you find them, everything you can about those customers. Uh, there is a, um, you've heard, probably heard of the 80-20 rule. That's not just an old wives' tale. It's called the Pareto Principle. It's a proven scientific principle. 80% of your results come from 20% of your uh, effort. 80% of your problems come from 20% of your customer, and 80% of your profit come from 20% of your customers. What you need to do is profile those 20% profits and profile the 20% that cause you 80% of your problem and figure out which customers to go after and which customers to avoid. You may find that, that uh, if you go to this town because it's affluent, they got a lot of engineers and whatever that, find out what's good about that town. That's where you want to prospect. If you have a town where the uh, housing prices are dropping, uh, probably not a good place to prospect. Uh, particularly, you know, if, uh, if the, pros if the uh, prospect, if the property values are dropping, and you do get a customer, you got to make sure that you get paid when it's all over. So, profile who your good customers, find out what they are and who they are, and who your bad customers are, who and what they are. Once you profile, then you're going to go prospecting for customers just like that profile. One of the hardest things to do is prospect. And as I go around, I ask people uh, who are busy, you know, what are you doing? Uh, and I get these ideas. So most of these ideas came from my customers who told me that I could share it. First of all, let's talk about advertising. When you, talk, when you advertise, even if there's nothing in the advertisement about price, it's perceived as price-based. You drive home tonight, look at billboards. Look at the percentage that have something about price on them. It's <coughs> over 50%. You know, more saving, more doing, uh, discount, uh, sale, whatever it is. So if you advertise, oftentimes, even if you don't intend it, don't talk anything about uh, uh, price, it becomes price-based in the minds of the customer. So you have to be really careful about advertising, and that's a personal prejudice tonight. Home shows. Half, half the people I talk to hate home shows, half of them love them. I told you I talk a lot about Wisconsin. Madison, Wisconsin, in spring, has three home shows back to back, a month apart. And uh, I did my uh, Wisconsin trip, and I was up in Madison, and I stopped in a customer that uh, wasn't a regular customer, but I'd friendly and called them all the time. And uh, I said, hey, the home show was two weeks ago. How'd you do? And he said, oh, it was below zero, and the Packers had a, had a uh, playoff game that weekend, and it was absolute. nobody came. It was terrible. I said, oh, that's too bad. Half hour later, I had one of my regular customers, and I walked in, and his mother-in-law was behind the, the desk, and she's, oh, Brian's in the back. He's busy. So I walked, and Brian's lifting slabs off a truck and among other things I said Brian how'd the home show go two weeks ago he said oh best home show I ever had I said he said I already got four sales out of it and I got two referrals and I got 12 more leads and I don't know how I'm ever gonna follow up on it. same show I said well Brian what'd you do I heard it was terrible he said you know what it wasn't real well attended but the people were there if they came out and below zero weather, there was a reason they were there. And if they were there for a countertop, I was going to get them. He said, I walked down the aisle, I passed out brochures, I greeted people, I was just, I was selling all the time. So home shows will work, but you can't sit down and hope somebody's going to come up and ask you to, to sell them on a countertop. You have to be selling all the time. Okay. You can also be the lowest priced guy in town. Just lower your price and advertise your $24 square foot grant. Now there's two advantages to doing that. The first is you don't need many customers. Well, first of all, it's easy because all you got to do is lower your price, right? But the second thing is you don't need many customers because you're not going to be in business long, so I don't recommend you do that one. You then you have to create a product that not only doesn't get uh, complaints, 
but uh, uh, the, the customer is so delighted that they want to make they want to tell all their friends and relatives about you. So then going back to uh, fine tune your production, that's part of your prospecting. When you're done with a um, countertop, how many of you guys leave maintenance instructions? Okay. Do you leave it, do you have your guys leave it on the countertop or something when you leave? Go over it with the customer and then I got like a little thing with our company and we'll go on and put maintenance things in the public cleaner with our name on it. Okay, good. That's great. I would suggest that if you wait, because they've got so many things going on, the chance of that maintenance instructions being lost somewhere you know, in the first couple of weeks there as they're cleaning up and moving everything and moving all their cereal boxes and things, I would suggest that you wait three weeks. And if you don't personally do the installation, you call them up and say, hey, uh, uh, hi, I, I, I'd just like to stop by and, and, and see the installation, make sure my guys did a good job. Do you mind if I stop in? And I've got some maintenance instructions I'd like to give you. Um, if you're doing it, you sound like you do it. But I, I like to laminate it. I mean, we have this. If, you probably all have one. If you don't have one, I'd be happy to email you one if you give me your card. Now, the, the key to this is, not only is that, but, you know, when they, if somebody comes in and they want it, now they can rip off and, and give their, out your card. So, and the cards are still there. So, that's, I would suggest you do it a couple weeks later. Now, I also suggest when you make that appointment, say, you know what, one of my vendors or, or the home builders, so somebody's having a kitchen of the month contest. I'd like to come and enter your kitchen. Can I take pictures of your kitchen? Now, when you go there, first of all, they're going to be thrilled that you think their kitchen's good enough to be entered in a contest. So you've, you've made them feel better about the process. Okay? The second thing is, um, when you get there to take your pictures, it's liable to be a little cleaner than it would be if you don't call ahead. Take with you a, a release form saying, you know, we're taking these pictures, we can use them for advertising in the contest, and, and they're all over the internet, these release forms. But if you take with your release form and get them to sign it, now you have the right to use it in advertising in other places. Okay? When you get back to the office, email them the pictures. Say, these pictures turned out great, and we're thrilled. Why don't you post them on Facebook or your other social media? Everybody, especially the 20-somethings, they can't help it. They've got to put it on Facebook. If they have the digital copies of the pictures, though, it's going on Facebook. That helps you. Particularly helpful is Angie's List. And if you don't know about Angie's List, find out about Angie's List. I have customers who swear all their business comes off of referrals on Angie's List. Okay. It may, you may have to invest 25 bucks to get your superstar customers to become members of Angie's List to recommend you. But that is particularly helpful. Okay, another uh, thing you can do is uh, direct mail has about a 2% return. It's terrible. It's awful. But I have a customer who uh, has a professional picture of one of the kitchens he's done. He puts it on a postcard, and the postcard message on the postcard is, we just completed a new kitchen in your neighborhood. Would you like to see the pictures? And he swears that, that, that would you like to see the pictures is a hook to get more, much more uh, higher percentage return rate. Yeah. If you're not like my lady who hates cold calls, there's no reason you can't go door to door and knock on doors with your literature and say, hey, we just finished the kitchen. Would you like to see the pictures? Um, you can do cold call. I mean, the phone calls are a little more problematic with all the no call lists and all the things in the caller ID. Uh, there's a lot of frustration in that, but there's no reason you can't go knock on doors. When you go to measure to, to template a kitchen, all right. template all the tops in the house. Do the bathroom. They don't have to template, just measure them so that you can quote them later. So do the top and the bar and even window sills. If you're good at doing window sills and you can show pictures of a window sill, so kind of measure the front window in their living room. Measure every other pos every other possible opportunity in the house. Uh, you can either then when you send them the final quote, you can include it in this project or Six months later, uh, you have a follow-up, you have a reason to call and say, hey, we found your, your uh, measurements in the, in, of your bathrooms in the file, and are you ready to do that project yet? It gives you a way to come back. The point of SFA is to 
learn from each other. Anybody else got any other ideas that uh, that they they'd like to share? Come on, I didn't figure them all out. Okay. So we're prospecting. We're getting in front in front of customers. That's phase one. Phase two is the actual face-to-face -face interaction with the customer. The first thing you got to do is build rapport. You have people buy from people, and people buy from people they like. Yes, they need a logical reason to buy from you. They can't just say, well, I'm buying from Susie because I like her. Well, I'm buying from Susie because they're thinking they like you, but they're, you justify it because of your unique selling proposition and all the other things. Some ways to build rapport. Uh, if they come in and Johnny's got his baseball uniform on, it's a great way to talk about it. the weather, uh, their car, if they've got a particular car, if you can talk about it. If you visit, if you do sales, uh, a direct call to our house, even if you don't like the house, there's always something you like about it. You know, oh, I love your staircase. Uh, I love your Italian tile in the front foyer. Uh, I love your landscaping. But you have to do it sincerely. If you fake it, the customer's going to know. And if you overdo it, you know, oh, I love your tile and your Ben, and Johnny's rolling trophy. And if you do too much of it, first of all, they're going to feel like you're wasting their time. And second of all, they're going to feel that um, you're not confident in your presentation because you're wasting so much time on building rapport. You have to build rapport. They have to like you, but uh, don't overdo it. You have to determine the decision maker. There's no sense in spending uh, you know, three days uh, with the missus going over countertops to find out that her husband makes all the decisions. I'm, I don't recommend it's the first thing you say out of your mouth. But very early in the process, you have to say, uh, uh, how do you make decisions on these kinds of things in your family? Or who besides you will be involved in this decision? You know, if, if, if they're in there and the mother really owns the house and lives with their mother, well, maybe the mother's got to make the decision. But who besides you, that's a real um, uh, saying, who besides you is involved in the decision is, is a non-threatening. If you say, who's the real decision maker here, it's kind of uh, antagonistic. But, who besides you makes that much less antagonistic. So some way you have to determine who the real, or how, not only who the decision maker is, but how it's made. Next is determine the needs and wants of the customer. Now your customer is not gonna understand this because they've never been sold anything this way. Um, sales is about asking, not telling. It's not about immediately come, oh, come on over and look at this beautiful top and, and it shines and it lasts forever and granite is so hard that you, you know, your kids are going to use it. It's about asking. Some great questions to ask are, um, how long do you plan to live in this house? That tells you if they're, if they're just doing it to sell or if they're going to list, you know, if it's a retired couple and say, oh, we've decided not to move down to Florida and we're going to live here the next 30 years, they're liable to have a bigger budget than somebody who's selling, putting on the sit on the market next week. Um, this is the most important part of the process, uh, and you've got to develop your own questions. Some other questions are, uh, uh, do you like unique countertops, or do you want it to look just like the sample? Uh, how are you going to use this? If they're going to use this countertop to manufacture in their orange juice and white wine business, you probably ought to know that, uh, so you don't uh, recommend white marble. You have to, based on your Experience, you're going to ask questions to hone it down and figure out exactly what uh, they're going to need. At this point, don't make any presentation. It's, it's real tempting when somebody says, oh, uh, my, my mother had this and can you do that, to come jump in and start selling. you got to resist that. At this point, you're only in the, in the uh, collection business. Uh, but you also, when somebody says, um, I want a marble top. Well, why do you say that? What do you know about something? What, what, what's behind it? Find out why they say they want a marble top. Because they may be using the wrong words and you don't even understand it. Now, I built houses for 20 years and uh, several years back we were building townhomes in Hoffman Estates, Illinois, and if any of you are from Illinois know that uh, Sears built this huge uh, new facility. This was back before they were part of Kmart. They built this huge facility, and we were real anxious to get somebody from Sears to buy from us, and we figured if we got the first person, it would lead to a lot more sales. And Betty was our 
seasoned sales professional, been done doing it for ever. And she finally got somebody who was in middle management, was moving into the Sears building, and she was working real hard on the sale. And the lady told her, the buyer, the prospect said, I don't want a basement. Well, Betty translate, used all her experience to translate that in that she didn't, couldn't pay for a basement or at least didn't want to pay for a basement. So she took that to the ownership and we figured out a way to, we did some financing and credits and we made the, the cost of the basement go away. A couple weeks later, Betsy, Betty gets a call saying the lady had bought a, a, a townhome in a neighboring community. So it was farther from work and Betty went over there, looked at it, it backed up to her arterial road, the standard features weren't as good. Betty was completely baffled because this, there's no way this lady could have bought this house. So she called her up and said, congratulations on, her on your new purchase. And she almost choked doing that. <laughs> and she said, can I ask you, what was the final determining factor to buy the other house? And she said, well, I told you I didn't want a basement. So then Betty asked the question that she should have asked in the beginning. Why don't you want a basement? Well, she said, well, I work for Sears, and Sears has a wonderful warranty department, including warranties on their sump pumps. And when a sump pump fails, I get the call. The poor lady had heard every horror story about flooded basements. She wasn't taking a basement if they gave it to her. So you have to find out what's behind the need. Make sure you got the right need or you're going to sell them to the wrong need. In this part of the process, actually during the entire process, the whole thing, but particularly here in the question and ask, uh, uh, question in determining need space, you have to be qualifying the customer. How are they reacting? You know, if you're talking with a couple, how are they reacting to each other? Are they fighting? Uh, you know, one abusing the other. You want to make sure not only that can you sell this customer, but you, can you sell this customer profitably? I had a, a customer in my housing business. We were already in the design of the house. And I was a little wary about them, and, and he says, oh, by the way, we need a penalty clause if you don't finish on time. So I said, well, you know, we, at that point, we finished 100 homes in a row on time to the day. So I said, well, you know, I told him that, and I said, why do you need a penalty clause? He said, well, my last house was late, and I needed that clause. So I asked him who his builder was. He wouldn't tell me. Well, I'm not a complete idiot, so I found out where he lived, and I had his address. And I found out who built that thing, and from the Home Builders Association, I found out who the builder was. So I called him up and I said, Neil, what do you know about Mr. Jones? And he said, don't walk away, run. <laughs> Turns out that they made changes to the entire project and didn't make their color selections on time, and when they were late, they wanted Neil to pay for it. Okay? So make sure not only can they pay for you, but is this going to be a profitable customer for you? The term and budget. You have to know what they're willing to pay. If you have a customer in there that says, well, i got this huge uh, uh, U-shaped kitchen, I measure the front edge and it's 10 lineal feet, and oh, I think it's about two feet deep, and so i got 10 square foot, and I saw a lawn sign for $25 a square foot, and I think I ought to get this for $500. As soon as you discover that, the better off you are. Okay, so uh, how do you add, what, what's your budget for this project? How much do you expect to spend on this project? Now, believe it or not, not everybody's going to want to share that number right away, right? So you have, but you still have to frame it. Now, if you've done all these questions, you've asked all the right questions, you, you probably have a pretty good idea in your mind what the, the project's going to cost. You, you know that's about a $9,000 kitchen or a $6,000. You've got in your mind the number. You say, okay, well, I understand that you don't want it, but are you more comfortable in the six dollars to $8,000 range or the eight dollars to $10,000 range? Now, don't under... Estimate. Don't say, are you comfortable in the three to six when you know it's an $8,000 kitchen. You've got to get in the right range. If they say, you know, well, what do you mean 6000 I want to be in the $3,000 range. Real quick, you're, you're wasting your time in there. So, you know, end it. Let them, you know, thank you for your time. I can't do that. Uh, if you're closer, okay, say that, that you think it's an $8,000 kitchen, but now they've mentioned they want this super duper edge and they want the... the, the super duper marble, whatever it is, um, and they say six to eight, so well, that might be a problem. They, 
you, you, you mentioned that you wanted this special marble top, this rare marble, and you want this. It might be a little more than that. Is that a problem? You have to determine. You have to narrow them down as much as you can. Only when you've got all their wants and needs, uh, you know, you know what their budget is. Now you have the ammunition to make a custom presentation. 